gentlemen, welcome to Retro Warriors episode 272. Woo. As always, I'm your host, Justin Baker, and as always, I'm joined by resident old bastard, Chris Saturn. You didn't say it weird that time. I did not say, <laughs> say it weird. I was going to try to. <laughs> I've ruined it. But then it. I couldn't remember how, 272, like I don't even know how he said it. Um, we do have housekeeping. Housekeeping. If you want to skip to the topic of this episode, then check the timestamps in the show description. They are there for you my week. Uh-huh. I have, I, I said I wasn't going to buy yep. Activision games. True. And I have not, uh-huh. but Andrew sent me an Activision game. Yeah. And it is Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1 plus 2 remaster by activision blizzard games it's a sports game right it is a sports game uh-huh. in the most technical <laughs> sense of the t- the term in in the same sense that we bowling is a sports game in the same sense that is mario a, kart is a racing game it is a sports game right um and and i i we talked about it a lot on talking wizards so i won't go super into it but i will say that it is a very faithful remaster of the first two Tony Hawk games uh-huh. with as little new stuff as they possibly could do. How's the online? Uh, the worst and non-existent. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> the games originally supported multiple game types via split screen, mm-hmm. which they still do. Yeah. But you can't play those online. Mm. Uh, they have an online mode, but it sucks and it's dumb and it's not fun. Right. Um, and it sure you can't would, free skate. Sure would suck if there was friends. like a global pandemic that prevented people from being able to play, you know, multiplayer on the couch. It would be hard, yeah. right? Um, be and it sure wouldn't be frustrating at all if the mental thought that if I'd gotten it on PC, we'd be able to play together via Parsec, yeah. but can't play together even though we have it on Xbox and we both have the same game on the yeah. same system mm-hmm. and pay for Xbox Gold. Mm-hmm. But Activision said, no, 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 you can do score attack online with right. six randos, and that's it. That's you very, can't play. very kind of Activision to offer that. You can't play horse. You can't do free skate. You can't do any of that. Uh, I have also been playing Batman Arkham Asylum, the first oh, one. the first one, yeah. Um, I, I, I had, I played, I've only played one of them, and it's the second one, uh, which is Arkham City. City? Yeah. And I played it, and I enjoyed it a lot. And then the, the and, one after that was Arkham City 2000. Yeah, that was... And then Arkham City Forever. Right. Had Jim Carrey in it. <laughs> and then... Um, I never played the original, um, because I tried to jump into it right after playing Arkham City, and right. it was too small mm-hmm. of a game, because uh, the whole thing with Arkham City is that you're in the city. Right. Um, and I, I just had a hankering for a third-person action game, so I fired it up. And it's been really fun. I'm playing on PC, and it's 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 a really good game. Yeah. I I don't think I appreciated how well written and well acted the oh, Arkham yeah. City was from when I played it originally. I mean, it's basically just more Batman animated series, but right. with different graphics. Yeah. To the point that I kind of really wish they just made it a Batman animated oh, series man, game because they great. really had so much of the voice cast right? that it would have been great. That would have been amazing. Um, but if you know wasn't meant to be uh and i in originally when i played arkham city i didn't love the kind of super edgy art style that it has right. it's bothering me less this time around in arkham asylum sure. um i don't know if that's just because we're kind of like post hardcore edgy in general mainstream pop culture or what um but it's it's not been bothering me I, so much. I and remember it's, it's been really that fun. one bugged me a bit when I first played it. Like graphically, I was like, I don't. This isn't how Batman characters look to me. But I was more used to to film and television and cartoon adaptations of Batman. Right. Um, but in retrospect, it feels far less gritty than every Batman <laughs> film since that has come out. True. Um. And I do really like that they have some very creative interpretations of some of the characters. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not just straight from the comics, which right. I, I like, you know, like Scarecrow in particular is, is really different and I like his sections a lot. They're really cool. Right. Um, it's, it's just very inventive with, with characters that have been done to death because yeah. they're Batman characters. Right. Um, I've also received and have been playing Super Mario 3D All-Stars, have I? um, which I think Eurogamer called, uh, two good games in a lackluster collection. <laughs> and I would agree. I would. I know they were rough. What about the third game? I would. Uh, the, they didn't say which two games. <laughs> they just said two great games and a lackluster. And I will say, 
They're the collection long. is se- severely lacking in features, yeah. but I am kind of starting to click and and with and enjoy some of the games in the yeah. compilations. Um, Mario 64 in particular, I've I've gone on record on the show as saying multiple times has aged poorly. I still and agree with that. I was playing it today and I was having so much fun that I almost wanted to retract that statement. Uh, and then I hit some really bullshit segments. Mm. And I didn't want to retract it, but I felt it less strongly. Yeah. You know, um, so guys, because I, I don't think I've been this enthralled with Mario 64 since I got it when I was uh, 10. I would have been. I have nearly gotten as far as I did on the PC port uh, a mm-hmm. few months ago. Uh, and, How many stars are you at? Uh, 20, I think. OK, so you're a little ahead of me. I'm at I'm at 16. Yeah, I'm only in the third course. Oh, yeah. I've done like. 10 courses oh yeah see i i stay on each course until i get all seven stars and oh no i don't do that i would i would one. rip all of my hair out animaniac <laughs> style i uh uh i my the in and i i realized because i was doing it naturally mm-hmm. today i realized that when i've revisited the game i tried to do it the way you're doing it mm-hmm. but the way i naturally want to play the game is i try an objective i fail a couple times then i run to the next room and try an objective there and oh that one worked and then i run to the next room and i just bounce back and forth and that's 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 where I get my enjoyment. I can't do it at all. That would drive me insane. Um, my as long as you go back to them all eventually. Yeah, no. Um, I can't. I can't leave it undone the whole time because then that's all I'll think about until I get back to it. <laughs> um, but no, I. Uh, uh, my biggest complaint with Mario sixty four remains the camera. It is you bullshit, know, and I. Hate I've been it. thinking about the camera a lot while playing it, uh-huh. and. I almost never even touched the camera mm. because you were explicitly complaining that the C buttons were mapped to a stick. Right. And in your words, that breaks some of the functionality. Well, also, the I original don't... functionality is broken. Right. Um, I, I don't I just almost never touched the camera in Mario 64. I... And I, I I don't know if some of it's that I just have muscle memory for a lot of these areas. So I don't need to see what's ahead of me. I think the only reason I ever finished it in the first place back in the day is I probably didn't touch it then either because mm-hmm. I wasn't used to playing 3D platformers yet. That's a fair point. And yeah. and now I am very used to 3D platformers and I am used to my camera always being directly behind my character unless I need to see a side or angled view. I want mm-hmm. it always behind my character. And Mario 64 does not allow that. There are many times... Well, it, it, it has a behind the character camera and it sucks yeah. so bad. Well, yeah, because it's right behind you. It gives you You're no You're staring distance. at his butt. Yeah. It's terrible. And, and even then, it kills that camera every now and then and forces you into another one. Yeah. Um, but the the standard camera refuses to rotate sometimes. Like, it'll, it won't do a full 360. It'll go, like, 270 mm-hmm. degrees and then fail to go any further. But if you go back around the other way, you can come back. The other back. direction. Yeah. And I noticed that as well. And even then, sometimes it'll be stuck at a weird angle and never quite go to where you want it. And I hate it. I hate it so I much. I think... I think I touched the camera probably, if I were to guess an amount, I probably adjust the camera one to two times every other level. Mm. I can't uh, turn without wanting to touch the camera. Yeah. I am realizing how much of these levels that I remember, hmm. that I don't remember remembering. I just <laughs> played so much Mario 64 right. that it's, it's, um, and I'm sure we'll talk about it yeah. some other time in the future, right. but uh, the handheld control scheme for Mario Galaxy is Trash. full on broken. Yeah. So I did want to put a disclaimer now, as early as we could, yeah. that if you are looking at getting 3D All Stars and you own a Switch Lite and thus will be playing in handheld mode exclusively, then um, I, I want you to know that the handheld control scheme for Galaxy, as of this recording date, is full on broken to the point that I don't know how you actually could right. play it in an effective manner. You could buy a controller and play it in tabletop. <clears throat> Even then, it's gyro on a tiny little screen. I feel like it would fly it's all over the place. Yeah. Um, so just just because I wanted to put that out there as a PSA for people with Switch lights that might be looking at picking up 3D All Stars. Yeah. Uh, if you're really excited about Galaxy, then you're gonna. It's yeah, not have gonna a bad time, work. Yeah. Um, although the switch light is smaller, maybe it'd be easier to touch. But even yeah. then, it's still. Yeah. I I I I I, sh- I shouldn't say broken. It does function. Maybe mm. look up a YouTube video on yeah. how the handheld mode is handled yeah. because it's uh, basically you have to aim your touch your uh, your star bits with your touch screen, 
and you can either fire them with the R2 button or uh, by tapping the screen, but it always uh, fires where the cursor was last, I believe. <laughs> Which, that's what it was doing for me. Yeah, instead of where you tapped. Which makes no sense. Right, because it's still based on a cursor system. It's not designed for a touchscreen. Yeah. Anyway, what else have you been up to? Uh, so uh, a friend of mine uh, who a year and a half, two years ago, something like that, came over and saw my RetroPie, was like, oh, that's amazing. I want something like that in my life. Uh, and like after that for weeks, he was like, okay, I'm going to let you know when I'm ready and I'm going to pay you to help me set that up. I want you to help build one for me, uh, like yours just so that I can play it. At which, at which point you just said, I'm not going to help you. I'm just going to do it. Cause yeah, pretty much. Yeah. 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 And I was like, you just tell me when you want it and we'll make it. And, uh, so now two years later, he finally is like, okay, I'm ready. <laughs> now's the time. Now's the time. So uh, I grabbed a, a spare pie that I had sitting around, and I ordered him a RetroFlag case, which the new RetroFlag cases come with tiny cartridges that yes. stick to the top with magnets, and it's adorable. Yes. Um, so I got him that. I got it set up. Uh, basically did a whole RetroPie setup from scratch, which I hadn't done in a while. Mm -hmm. uh, so I got to see what it was like to uh, uh, sync the controller the first time, to set up the keyboard the first time, set the the, uh, the Wi-Fi the first time, uh, to reinstall background music, to to change custom themes so that it says Genesis instead of Mega Drive and Turbo right. Graphics instead of PC Engine. Basically, the stuff I have to do every other month because I constantly bork all my retro <laughs> setups. Yeah, because I haven't redone mine in a very long time, um, yeah. and and I hit some real frustrating points. Um, the the first one that that really bugged me was the uh, I finally got the scraper working the way that I wanted it to, but I couldn't get it to transfer games for some reason for a little while there, and I discovered that was a a network issue in my house and had nothing at all to do with the RetroPie, but it still drove me insane for a while there, um, and and then aside from that was was mostly small stuff. It was all like stuff that I've taken for granted that I set up years ago, like SSH and and uh, uh, FTP and all that little stuff that that makes setting up the RetroPie easier. But but now I feel like I could probably handle it again, but I won't for another five years, and I'll have forgotten by then. <laughs> of course, yeah. as is tradition. Mm -hmm. Um. Let's jump into some news. Yes, sir. Uh, first up, Apple releases a new App Store rule that allows streaming game services so long as each game is released as its own app, huh. thus defeating the entire purpose of a game streaming service. Yeah, so it's it's almost like Apple is shooting this entire idea <laughs> in the foot repeatedly right. until it goes away. Yeah, and... And the thing is, uh, they don't require this for film streaming services for some reason. I can't imagine huh? why. That's weird. That would, because it's almost like that would be silly mm -hmm. and nonsensical and non-functional. Right? That's weird. But hey. But for, for GeForce Now and xCloud and Stadia, this is clearly the best way. Uh, NVIDIA purchased ARM for $40 billion. Yeah. Uh, First of all, this is a megaton thing yes. in the... This is one of those headlines that I feel like most of the mainstream press will see and be like, I don't know what that means. <laughs> but everyone else is like, no, this is humongous. Oh, yeah. This is like Microsoft purchasing Nintendo level <laughs> humongous. This is, yeah. this is giant. Yeah, this is big in a lot of ways because one, uh, uh, Apple is talking about moving to ARM for upcoming MacBooks. Not even talking. I believe the it is, is it in the now? works. Okay. And now Apple is having to deal with NVIDIA, whom they hate. Yes. And they also use ARM-based technology for all the iPhones and uh, uh, iPads and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, of course, RetroPies are built around ARM processors. Uh, yeah. The Nintendo Switch uses an ARM, which, granted, it's one already running the NVIDIA Tegra <laughs> chipset. So uh, Nintendo is already right. used to dealing with NVIDIA on it. Um, but the number of things all around us every day that are running arms from from smart speakers and smart screens and really, if you buy consumer electronics today uh, and it's an, an SOC, then yeah. it's an arm process, probably arm or something arm based. 
And so this is this is massive. Oh yeah, and it, absolutely massive. And Intel has been trying to get in on uh, the video card game for a while now with their Intel HD. They've never been able to make something that'll really play a game, but they want to cover everybody who doesn't need games a hundred percent. And of course, AMD, who is Intel's biggest competitor in the CPU market, uh, has always been making their own GPUs. And NVIDIA competes with both of them in the GPU front and now also in the CPU front. Yeah, it is. I, I think this is going to be looked back on in 20, 30 years yeah. as a very early move that completely shifts a lot of the market right. in some interesting ways. Yeah, so think, just as far as from a tech journalism standpoint, this is not only just a massive acquisition, yeah. uh, it's also really interesting from a technology standpoint. And my favorite part, though, was... Uh, uh, when I heard the story on NPR and the NPR uh, uh, business reporter reported it as computer company NVIDIA. That's <laughs> <laughs> just, I was like, okay, good job. NPR. Oh man. Yeah. This is one that, that um, again, pe- pe- the per- people on the street are going to be like, I don't know what you just said, kid <laughs> who bought um, an arm. Yeah. So this what is, what are they doing is- with that arm? Nuts and unexpected. I didn't oh, yeah. even know they were in talks. Right? Uh, absolutely uh, out of the blue. It was crazy. Very interesting. Right. Uh, Super Mario Brothers three prototype sells for over thirty one thousand dollars, and it's not even as fun <laughs> as the retail release. <laughs> but it does come in a Kid Icarus cartridge that they partially peeled the label off of <laughs> and wrote Super Three. There you go. Perfect. <laughs> uh, I'm. I'm. Hopefully, it ends up in the uh community right um i don't know who bought it or what their intentions are but for thirty one thousand for thirty one thousand dollars i imagine uh they're not gonna let it go for cheap or free right. as far as dumping that wrong. but it did sell for a lot less than that sealed retail copy of super mario brothers which you can easily download on uh the switch or the wii u or previously on the wii i think you can just say everything because you can download it on everything right whereas this prototype of super mario 3 that is literally only on this prototype and we may never see again it's only 31 grand there i don't i don't get it i don't it I, i'll tell you what it is mm. is it's investors and they're looking for uh ways to dump money into things that appreciate in value but, reliably but why is this worth le- worth less than that it doesn't make sense to me because they don't know what the fuck it is. They really Saturn. fucking don't. When you see a sealed Super Mario Brothers, you're like, oh, it's Mario Super Mario Brothers. You can show it to a person on the street and they'll be like, yeah, that's one of them. They're Nintendo games. Yeah. But if you show them this thing, they're like, who fucking broke that toaster? <laughs> <laughs> what is Super 3 and what does it have to do with Mr. Icarus? The Switch hit the highest ever console sales for an August, breaking the previous record set by the Wii. Gasp. Switch is doing so well. And as much as I mo- very recently have been enjoying complaining about Nintendo and will continue <laughs> to do so, right. I do love the Switch. Yeah. What a great system. Yeah, I'm I'm still very happy with the Switch. I'm not as happy as I wanted to be with it. Uh, True. Going I'd into it, uh, I remember <laughs> hearing promises that it was going to be the best combination of Nintendo handheld and Nintendo uh, home uh, consoles all in one. And instead, we got uh, a, a similar hybrid of those two, but with half the release schedule. You know, at Nintendo, you can you can buy my good faith back. I'll let you buy it, and all it's going to cost you is a Kid Icarus Uprising remake with fixed controls. I thought you were going to say you... a Kid Icarus Uprising cartridge with the label ripped off that says <laughs> Super Three on Someone it. Someone wrote Super Three on it. Uh, Bloomberg reports Sony cut initial PS5 production orders by four million units, and then Sony refutes the claim. Right. Which who knows? So, yeah, who knows? We know it's uh, sold out. That's as much as we know so far. Super Mario 3D All-Stars found to be using basic N64, GameCube, and Wii emulators with residual data found for other games, including Perfect Dark and Kirby 64. No real surprises there. Eh? Uh, I will say that I did read some more, and I don't remember if it was... I want to say it was Galaxy. Hmm. It might have been Sunshine, but one of them was only partially running in an emulator, and some other... Was it? Yeah, and hmm. some other layer of it is run natively. Yeah, from what I was reading, the the CPU... Uh, natively handles the code, whereas the GPU is emulated. Okay. Uh, Nintendo adds new words to the forbidden names list, including... 
coronavirus. Yeah. And some others the, <laughs> that I didn't really want to say on the show. Uh, yeah, let's, let's we'll just stick to the, the silly one. Yes. And then uh, I don't know why you can't be named. I guess I guess I guess it does make some sense. Right. Um, it's just weird. I'm waiting for some kid named coronavirus to complain about it, though. <laughs> <laughs> There's got to be at least one. <laughs> um, scat online or scat <laughs> added to Pardon me. Scat added to NES online. The peacekeepers. Donkey Kong Country 2 and Mario's Super Peacross added to SNES online on 923. Yeah. Uh, so that's a, a decent lineup. I will say that as much as Nintendo Switch Online is a disappointment yeah. compared to the amount of virtual console releases we used to see on a weekly basis right. before like 2009, yeah. um, I do like that they're kind of adding some weirder stuff in there. A lot of weirder you know, stuff. It's, it's not all just like every NES black box game again. Yeah. Because I really thought that's, I think that's even what I predicted what they were going to do. <laughs> it's true. And, the, and there are a lot of black box yes. games on there, but they've been good about it. But also Scat. Also Scat Online. I, <laughs> I'm i I'm surprised to see Mario Super Picross because uh, it's untranslated. And mm-hmm. as someone who has long been a fan of uh, Picross, I tried the Super NES ROM of Mario Picross probably 25 years ago. Mm-hmm. And I had a hard time navigating it without a translation. So I do, I do like um, the two things I do love about Nintendo Switch Online is the SP versions of games they do for right. NES games, which, which I, I wish they do while. for SNES games. Um, yeah, I'm worried they're done with it. Yeah, uh, but I also love that they do seem to be bringing some. Even though you can just download the Japanese version of right. you know Super Famicom Online, I do like that they're bringing some of these to the American side of things. Yeah. It at least shows some goodwill as far as like, yeah, we're willing to give you dumb Americans some some of the weirder Japanese right. stuff, which they did back it, in the uh, Virtual Console days too. Occasionally, also we true. We got some, some, we got yeah. Sin and Punishment. We got a yeah. uh, Mario. Uh, we got a uh, Do Re Mi Fantasy. I think yeah. we got. Yeah. Um, a Rondo Nintendo, of Blood. Oh yeah, Rondo is the big one. Yeah. I'm, I'm over here like, oh, the sequel to Mylon's Secret <laughs> Castle. And you're like, but Rondo. And also Mario 2. Uh, Nintendo Direct Mini revealed two new Monster Hunters, Disgaea 6 and Ori and the Will of the Wisps, coming to Nintendo Switch. Yeah. So that's exciting. Mm-hmm. As a Monster Hunter fan who didn't love World and for some reason didn't click with it, I always want more traditional Monster Hunters. Yeah, and uh, there's a traditional Monster Hunter and what looks to be a Monster Hunter <laughs> JRPG hybrid. Which they did previously on 3DS. Right. Um, or I don't know if it was a full-on JRPG, but it was a story-focused right. Monster Hunter. And then um, uh, Ori, uh, uh, Xbox Studios and uh, uh, I Am 8-Bit, teamed up to say that they were releasing this giant collector's edition box with all this like really nice looking art and shit but it's 150 dollars and it includes both ori games and several people scoffed at that price understandably and so i am 8-bit came out on twitter and was like no 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 there'll be a regular retail release too don't worry about that uh gba prototype unit found on yahoo auctions came in a lot with other handhelds for about 670 dollars so yeah Cool. Yeah, there, um, there was like 10 GBAs in that lot, a handful of Game Boy Colors, a PSP, a PS Vita, and this one like Space World 2000 prototype <laughs> Game Boy Advance. Interesting. And they uh, and they powered it on, and it has the, the different startup sound than the retail mm-hmm. unit does, just like one of the old test kits that has been floating around out there. Uh, I heard the shoulder buttons are missing the lip. Yeah, they don't the have the lip, lip on, on the, the shoulder buttons. Home. And any later game that is uh that uses compressed textures just looks like garbage because it doesn't know how to do it uh nintendo 3ds production has officially ended <sighs> i think i predicted a month or two ago when i bought my new 2ds xl that it was right around if you want if you want a 3ds you need to get one now oh, because yeah. by this holiday season they are not going to be on shelves right um, so I will say it again. If you want a 3DS and you are after one at a reasonable non-inflated price, now is the time. you better start looking now because they're already getting a little hard to find. And it's, this is only going to exacerbate it. It's weird. When the DS was discontinued and the 3DS was around, DS lights got dirt cheap. When the GBA was discontinued and DSs were around, the GBA got dirt cheap. I don't see that happening again soon with a Nintendo console. No. The, the, the 3DS is just too good of a value right. i think yeah. and there's too many i don't know i don't know i don't know yeah 
Uh, Sony confirms no PS1, PS2, or PS3 support on PS5, no which surprise. we've been guessing at for a while. Uh, but then there was this quote. Oh, boy. Uh, and I can't remember the, the person's name. I'm was looking something it up now. Something Ryan. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm something like that. Um, and the quote is, When we've dabbled with backward compatibility, I can say it is one of those features that is much requested but not actually used much. Yeah. That and I was a Grand Turis- at a Gran Turismo event recently where they had PS1, PS2, PS3, and PS4 games. And the PS1 and the PS2 games, they look ancient. Like, why would anybody play this? Uh, Jim That's Ryan a, is who said Jim that. Jim Ryan. That's a Sony executive yeah. asking why anyone would want to play PS1 or PS2 games. Months after Motherfucker, they released Motherfucker, it's the because we like them. Um, Less than yeah, a year. M- months after the PlayStation Classic. Yeah. I, I, I can't think of a worse way for Sony to basically tell the retro gaming community and the game preservation community to fuck off. Right. We don't care that you like our company's legacy and are willing to give us money for it. Right. We want you to buy the new Spider-Man, the new God of War, the new whatever right. exclusives. We don't give a shit about all of our old games. We don't give a shit about the fact that... We have digital games, yeah. PS1 games, PSP games, PS2 games, and PS Vita games that you literally cannot buy or play on our most recent hardware that are just languishing on servers. Yeah. I, I don't... I don't get it. I don't, I don't understand. I just... I do not understand how out of touch with the burgeoning retro gaming community they, they can be. Uh, and granted, I'm sure they're making a shit ton of money ignoring us. Oh yeah, I, I I mean I I think it's it's one of those moments where you have to realize how small of a community right. we really are a part sure. of compared to the community for like literally any single AAA game. Right. Yeah. Compared to any uh, Activision or Ubisoft game that we would shit on, we are a small fraction of that. Uh, right. But you know, that's they don't even have to develop anything new. <laughs> they already have the emulators. They've made I them. Know. I know. It's just uh, the most powerful PlayStation ever, but we're not going to make it emulate this old dumb shit. <laughs> Fuck you, Sony. Right. Mario 3D All-Stars is crashing on hacked switches, shocking <laughs> no one. Um, I, I, I do want to say that I am always in favor of you doing what you want with right. your hardware that you paid for. But I will also always forewarn you yeah. that hacking a console that you are still wanting to buy new releases right. for is dangerous ground because Nintendo is very big on every iterative game release. They find some way to block out right. previous hacks. And, and apparently what it was was they added a new uh, compiler to a firmware a while back and it uses that. And it's mm-hmm. one of the first games to use said compiler. Uh, and, uh, hackers have already found a way to inject it into the custom <laughs> firmware. Of course. But... Uh, if you didn't get that new update, then uh, then you cannot effectively play 3D All Stars. And finally, Michael Ansel retiring Michelle. from the game industry. Uh, pardon me, Michelle. I read that as Michael. Yes. I don't know who this person is. Uh, I believe he created uh, Beyond Good and Evil. I want to say Rayman ah. as well. Okay. Um, he's uh, and he's, he's going to work in. Um, wildlife i believe with, so. with what, something like that something with wildlife i believe that it is was his very other weird. passion and he is moving he is pivoting towards that um he has been a a, a big force at ubisoft for a very long time a lot of the mm-hmm. ubisoft games that are beloved by uh the community at large uh have been from him um, yeah so uh it is it is tragic to see him stepping down after Fuck, almost 30 years in the mm. industry, 25 years in the industry. Um, but, you know, good on him. Let him let him retire while he still can before he's remembered as a villain or something. You go help those animals, Michelle. <laughs> uh, getting to the topic at hand, uh-huh. this week we are talking demakes and downpours. Yes. And you may be asking, a what now? <laughs> let me explain. Yes. A demake is a game that is basically remade and redesigned entirely to fit the platform it's being put on. So it is its original game in usually name only. Right. A downport is a game that makes technical, often graphical concessions to move one experience as intact as possible to another often less powerful platform. Right. 
Um, and just a note on scope: we are not going to mention every D make and down for it. We we just like them and want to. But talk I wrote about them, them all down here in this eight thousand page document. <laughs> I know it's quite long. <laughs> Um, let's start with some listener feedback. First up, Robbie writes in, how about that Silent Hill HD collection on 360? It was a bigger downgrade than the Final Fantasy VII NES game. Who would have thought that removing the fog and hiring voice actors straight out of the janitorial staff of Konami USA would detract from the original experience? You know, I, I watched a, uh, first of all, it, technically it is not a, a down port. It's technically to right. superior hardware. They just fucked it up True. hard. It's just so shitty that it's, so it's bad. a down port. It's really, really bad and don't buy it. Uh, but I, I saw an interview with some of the people who were actually behind it having to speak an, anonymously off the mm-hmm. record. Uh, well, they were on the record, but anonymously. Their names were off the record. Um, but they, they were basically saying that uh, uh, it was entirely a money thing. Like, all the team that were working on it were like, if we can spend more time, we can make this look amazing. And mm-hmm. the upper-level executives at Konami kept telling the mid-level executives, no, you have exactly this much time and budget. It must be on, at, at store shelves by then. And so they, right. they just kept having to cut things back more and more. So... Uh, I don't blame the people who worked on it. I don't even blame the directors on it. I 100% blame Konami. <laughs> uh, Elk Nadafs writes in, When I got my Retron 5, one of the first things I experimented with was video game demakes. Nice. I started with what is probably regarded as the most famous of demakes, Final Fantasy VII for the NES. The game world had been downsized, right. systems like material and equipment had been simplified, but it was mostly intact. Right. Oh, yeah. I would find that not all demakes are bootlegs take pac-man championship right. edition for example which recently released on modern consoles as an 8-bit port which can be extracted and played on original hardware yeah. namco did it with pac-man recently but tingen did it way back in the day with hard driving right. hiring mark morris to demake or down part down port the 3d arcade racing game to the nes and the results are phenomenal oh, yeah. hard driving has no business running better on the nes than it does on mm-hmm. the genesis Although, with the Genesis version, I do appreciate the extra time I have between frames to go grab a <laughs> snack or something. I almost added the Genesis version of, of Hard drive in as a bad example, uh, but I skipped it because I was not a huge fan of the arcade game, so I don't consider myself yeah. a, an expert. Um, let's talk about arcade conversions and the console life cycle. Yeah. Um, so this is a big this, thing in the eighties and nineties, especially. Yeah. And this kind of gives some context of why this sort of became a regular practice. practice. Yeah. Because I feel like there are two major reasons. There's this, there's the arcade to home down right. port or D make, yeah. um, that just as a matter of fact, the home consoles aren't as powerful. Right. So we have to figure something out. And then I feel like there's this big gap. And then there's this, this, the rise of like D makes and down ports, because these are licensed properties that just have to be on everything. Right. Yeah. Um, but go ahead and tell us uh, about the arcade conversions and so, their life cycle. Yeah, it was it was basically just this this uh, this cycle. Uh, anytime a new home console was released, it was usually pretty good at handling arcade conversions of that exact day. But mm. within a year or two, the arcades would shoot past it, uh, and you'd start to see some 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 riskier conversions. <laughs> Risky conversion is the <laughs> nicest phrasing <laughs> I've ever heard for a down port. <laughs> Oh, that's a risky conversion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there were there were some that uh, I don't know how they got greenlit, um, and and that pretty much lasted until the late nineties when you started to see uh, consoles that one could keep up with arcades and two arcade machines based on consoles. You had uh, famously right, converged. Uh, arcades based on the PS One, arcades based on the Dreamcast, uh, and then uh, I want to say that that Sega released some based on Xbox hardware as well. Um, and then of course, uh, home PCs also were not immune to this, even though they had advanced processing power, uh, handling an arcade or console conversion within the confines of an existing operating system, which was usually designed for business use, rarely made for a really great experience. Right. Um, so I just kind of, this is one of those weird topics where we don't really have anything in depth to say about anything. No. But we just want to talk about a lot of them. Yes. Because a lot of these don't really warrant much attention. Right. And a lot of the time, we just don't have a lot of information about how some of these things were made. Right. Now, um, for the record, though, 
I am a huge fan of this kind of thing. I love yes. like when I first uh, in the late 90s, when I first had access to arcade emulation and also there was viable NES and Super NES and Game Boy and Genesis emulation and all that stuff. I would love to just back to back play every version of a game just to mm-hmm. see which ones were shittier than others. Uh, and and I, right. I love it, seeing what it, it sacrifices they had to make just to get something to to handle on this platform or the other. And some of these, when you hear that it was on that platform, you're like, "There's no, it wasn't. <laughs> it's not possible." Right. So let's start with um, the first category, which is games that got lots of demakes or downports. And first up is Street Fighter, Street Fighter Two, and Street Fighter Alpha, which yeah. are going to lump together, right. um, because they were both on a shitload of stuff. Oh, yeah. I, and I play, I played a few of them. Um, it's Street I Fighter played, One got a pretty good port to the Turbo CD. To be fair, a good port of Street Fighter One is still a terrible game. Correct. Um, <laughs> um, Street Fighter Two. I played the Master System version oh. of Street Fighter Two. Yeah, the Brazil exclusive one. That's really Super Street Fighter Two. Oh my god! Yeah. It it is so bad. It's, it's fascinating how bad that game yeah. is. Conversely, um, and, and, the black and white Game Boy port of Street Fighter Two surprisingly pretty good. Yeah, and doesn't that have full Super Game Boy support? It does have Super Game Boy support, including two player on one console. <laughs> uh, all the characters are super tiny. They look like something out of Ninja Gaiden, um, but but it's pretty faithful as far as the actual gameplay goes. Right. Um, and and the Alpha games, I played Alpha on Game Boy Color. Color. Yes. And it was a really fun fighting oh, yeah. game. I played a lot of it. Yeah, it's a surprisingly good port. And the thing about those uh, 8-bit ports of the Street Fighter games is they all have two buttons. Right. Instead of six. Uh, right. So it feels very different, but they all... Uh, the ones handled by Capcom internally, anyway, and the Street Fighter Alpha handled by Crawfish, I want to say, are all mm-hmm. very faithfully done, considering what their uh, original product was. Yeah, it's it's one of those things where even much later Street Fighter games, like Street Fighter uh, uh, 4 on 3DS, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I played the shit out of that, yeah. and it had some... So it was a risky conversion, <laughs> you know, but uh, it functioned. Yeah. You know, uh, Capcom seemed to really make good on the fact that, like, hey, we want you to be able to play Street Fighter on whatever right. you have, and even if we have to make it kind of weird to do it. Right, and there was a couple of Street Fighter ports on GBA as well. There was uh, Street Fighter Alpha 3, which was excellent for a GBA yeah. game. And then there was also, I want to say, Super Street Fighter 2 Revival, I think they called it. Yeah, and that I've one that one, on, that one on looked GTA. good, but I don't think it played as well as Alpha Three did. Yeah. Um, next up, we have Mortal Kombat One through Three, which was not as successful at being ported down. No, there was the Mortal Kombat Advance, the GBA version, which, which is I've not the played. Worst thing that's ever happened. <laughs> and what's fascinating is that Mortal Kombat ran fine on the Super Nintendo, and the GBA is more powerful than the Super Nintendo. So Mortal Kombat Advance tries to be like this hybrid Mortal Kombat Three, Mortal Kombat trilogy kind of thing, mm-hmm. and it's terrible at it. It was the first ever game, if I remember right, that got a zero point zero rating in EGM. <laughs> Uh, it's it's barely playable. Like I think if I remember right, it runs at eight frames a second. Oh no! Uh, it's eight something like it. It's it's single digits. <laughs> um, and a lot of the moves are either non-existent or changed to the point where you can't possibly figure out what they were supposed to be. Right. Um, and it just looks like butt. Like yeah. The system should be able to at least make it look okay if you change the resolution a little bit. And they just kind of stretch some things, but not other things. And it just looks like ass. Uh, You've got Mortal Kombat 3, which was ported to uh, the Game Gear and the Sega Master System. Yeah. Don't play any of the Game Gear Mortal Kombat games, by the way. Uh, Or the Game Boy Mortal Kombats. Don't play those either. Were there any good ports of those? Uh, The Genesis and Super NES ports. Right, I mean, obviously those. <laughs> but, uh, uh, those those are the only good down ports of the first three Mortal Kombats. Uh, you have Sonic the Hedgehog 1 and 2, yeah. which was ported to the Genesis... Well, of course it was on the Genesis. <laughs> it was ported to the Genesis Saturn. It was ported to the GBA. Yes, as Sonic the Hedgehog Genesis, which is famously one of the worst ports of all time. 
I've not played that one. It's really bad. The physics are That's wrong. That's sad because Sonic Advance is great. Oh, they yeah, made those three great. great Sonic Advances on GBA. And one of them, you can buy one that I want to say is a combo pack. It's one of the advances and then one of the other Sonics or maybe it's Spinball. I, I thought there was one that was also Sonic Advance 1 and 2 is a combo. But I think you're correct, yeah. But yeah, Sonic the Hedgehog Genesis on GBA is <clears throat> just awful. Uh, the sound, I don't know what they did. Um, it runs at a weird speed. GBA. Yeah. Uh, it runs at a weird speed. The controls don't always respond. Sonic has some weird physics. Um, if if you're interested, load up an emulator and try it out. And it's... Uh, I don't know that you'll finish the first level or two. I'm not sure if the developers finished the first level or two. Sonic the Hedgehog 1 and 2 were also ported to uh, the Master System? Well, it's not the same game least... on Master right. System. Uh, but it's called Sonic the Hedgehog. Correct. It's the same game that was on uh, Game Gear as Sonic 1 and 2. Yes. Uh, yes. They, they frequently refer to it as 8-bit Sonic. Mm. Uh, and they it... don't refer to that to it as that in the title screen. Nope. They just call it Sonic. <laughs> And it's, it's an okay game, as long as you're not expecting the Genesis game. Right. Uh, then you have Doom, which I don't think we can even technically list in a whole show everything <laughs> that Doom has been ported to. Most recently, a pregnancy <laughs> test. That's true. <laughs> um, but Doom was on everything for years. Oh, people yeah. were kind of chasing the good home console port of Doom. Yeah. And, um, uh, and they almost got I think, there. I think early on, 32X was regarded as one of the, the better early right. home console ports. The, the Super NES one into... was considered impressive, but not necessarily good. Right. Uh, the I think there was a the PlayStation there's yeah. a PlayStation port wasn't there? It was supposed to be pretty Final good. Doom. Yeah. Um, there's a GBA port of Doom. There is, which I've not and, played. And Doom Two, and they they play surprisingly okay on Game Boy Advance. I wouldn't huh. recommend them if you have any other option. But which, uh, if you exist on earth then you do have another right. option because again doom runs on everything yeah, you can play it on your phone now um our next category is systems with lots of d makes or down ports which yeah. this time we're just talking systems and we have to start with the king of d makes and down ports uh and that's the game gear and the sega master system which we lump together because they're largely the same internal oh, yeah. hardware yeah um the game gear kind of is a portable master system right uh it's um that's that's just kind of how the Game Gear... It has a lower resolution than the Master System. And, of course, right. you don't have a second controller port. Uh, but otherwise, it is it is largely just a Master System. Basically, every big Genesis game has a version on Master System. Most of them, yeah. For the first several and years, anyway. Just about any licensed Genesis game has a counterpart on Game Gear. Right. And in Brazil, they ported a lot of those Game Gear games back to Sega Master System. Yeah. Uh, and then you have the Game Boy Color, Game Boy, uh, the original Game Boy, the Game Boy Color, and the Game Boy Advance, which, as we've been, we've mentioned the GBA multiple times yeah. already, they are both uh, D make and downport powerhouses. There are oh, yeah. tons of, uh, the GBA especially feels especially rife with them, I think, because right. the Game Boy and the Game Boy Color were just limited technically enough mm -hmm. that you got things like the Street Fighter 2 conversion that were a risky conversion <laughs> it was it was basically a different game right but the gba was close enough yeah that you could that almost get a super nes game perfectly on pe there. people seem to think they could do it and then you'd get sonic the hedgehog <sighs> on it um and you had tons of stuff you had like tales of fantasia oh, yeah. you had um you had all of the, the final fantasies you had yeah all the final fantasies you could consider all the um, super mario games yeah, um, which I guess, you know, because we, we talked about this, you were like, well, wouldn't those really be remakes? And I was at the same time, I was like, well, they're kind of down ports in the sense that it's ported to a, a like the, the processor in the GBA is more powerful than the right. Super Nintendo and has more RAM. It's a sound downgrade yeah. and it's a playability downgrade because now you're downgrade. on a... Yeah, in a resolution downgrade. So it's, it's kind of that weird fuzzy area right. where the, the Final Fantasy games and the Mario games are... Sort of, they're a down port of sorts. Port right. parts of the game are ported down for it. Right. They have to be. Yeah. Um, but then they added so much content that right. most people call them remakes. Yeah. When very technically, I don't know that they are. And whereas on the Game Boy and the Game Boy Color, you got a lot more of those uh, uh, definite 
down ports, uh, things right. that could barely classify as the original. And then other things where they they did such a neat job of skating around it by making an original product that's virtually the same, like Donkey Kong Land versus Donkey Kong Country. Right. Where it's it's a similar enough product, but obviously not Donkey Kong Country because that was a much better game. Or like um, you get interesting things like Nemesis yeah. on Game Boy, yeah. which is... A great version of Nemesis. Yeah, yeah it's, um, it's not the same as the original Gradius, but it's very similar. Right. Uh, you have the Atari, which got lots of down ports. Oh, God. Uh, really, really demakes more than down ports. It's <laughs> yeah. kind of in the same boat as the Game Boy in that it was so technically limited yeah. to compared to all hardware that came after it that you kind of have to that remake said, something. There were some games on there that were pretty faithful recreations of their, ar- their arcade version. Uh, Mm -hmm. especially early on you had pong which uh, it was more powerful than pong so it handled that just fine uh even stuff like breakout right when the system came out breakout was huge and uh, donkey kong donkey kong plays on there yeah you had pac-man pac-man was converted to the uh, atari yeah um uh spider-man there were so many arcade conversions on atari probably half of the system's library is arcade conversions yeah uh, you have, uh, I put the Neo Geo Pocket Color in yeah. here. It's kind of in a weird category where most of the games are obviously not even really demakes or downports. They're just kind of inspired by. Right. They're like spinoffs, uh, kind of. Yeah. And most of them, they've changed the names from their bigger Neo Geo counterparts. So they're, but but they, they really are essentially handheld versions of those games. Yeah. The, the Neo Geo Pocket Color is basically a system of exclusively d makes right uh if you're a neo geo fan right um the, so it, it's the only one that i would say the ones that they did try to actually downport and like keep the same experience and gameplay mm-hmm. would be things like metal slug right um but even that 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 that's bad <laughs> you know their fighting games however are fantastic yeah. they're fantastic d makes of their their larger counterparts almost across the board right uh, and then we have basically all Tiger Electronic handhelds. Yeah. Um, they they for a while they were just themed after properties. Yeah. yeah. Licensed properties, Cartoons and then eventually and they'd be like, "Oh, this game is popular. Here's Mortal Kombat yeah. on a three frame Tiger Electronic handheld, yeah, or or Simon's Quest, or, or Street <laughs> Fighter Two. I had the Street Fighter Two one. Oof. I remember it. I'm sorry. I want to say Blanca was on yep. it. I it, was say it was Blanca, Blanca and had, Honda. I feel like Chun Li was in there. Maybe, maybe there were different I don't remember. versions. But for people that have not played Tiger Electronic handhelds, they're making sort of a weird comeback, Why? and they still they still suck. Yeah, uh, they're bad. They're not playable. And I'm saying that as a uh, a continuing fan of di- virtual pets <laughs> who still buys them. So trust right. me when I say if I if I say a piece of uh, LCD '90s electronics <laughs> tchotchkes are crap, I mean it. Right. Uh, they're bad yeah they're real bad they weren't good then i don't know why people have nostalgia for them i don't even know if they count as d makes or down ports <laughs> as much as just games that had the same name to sell you trash i'm not sure they count as games <laughs> i you know i think i'd agree with that <laughs> uh and we also have to have a special note for the tiger game com yeah. With its attempted ports of the Mortal Kombat trilogy, Duke Nukem 3D, Fighters Mega Mix, and Resident Evil 2 onto an unlit monochrome LCD screen. Touchscreen. What the fuck were they thinking? I don't know. It's really bad. I I have Duke 3D and Resident Evil 2. I've been looking for Mortal Kombat trilogy for a while. Uh, Fighters Mega Mix got really expensive for a fucking Gamecom game. I'm not willing to spend a dollar um, yeah, but uh, uh, they're all really bad. They're barely playable. It's just uh, it's a joke. Uh, and then we have mobile ports, which encompasses the engage. Yeah, um, because obviously um, we have smartphones now, right. but for a long time we had feature phones mm-hmm. and lots of games reported to feature phones. Most of them, not maybe not most of them, but lots of them are probably lost to the ages right. these days. Oh, yeah. Um, I remember playing a down port of Splinter Cell on <laughs> a feature phone. That that on port my... is on Engage. Is it? Yeah. I played that. Yeah. And the Engage, as you, you noted here, is almost exclusively down ports. Yes. Uh, it's almost uh, exclusively ports of those mobile phone ports. Oh, man. Um, now, the... Uh, uh, 
the the games that I remember playing on on mobile phone. I had Mega Man Two uh, mm-hmm. ported to my uh, LG Chocolate. Oh no! I had uh, mm-hmm. something mm-hmm. called Castlevania. Yeah, which kind of looked like Castlevania One. Yeah, uh, I had Arkanoid on mine. Oh, that probably would have been okay. Yeah, um, it wasn't. <laughs> I had something called Silent Hill. It was a first person uh visual novel that uh that I don't know if it had an end. Yeah. Wasn't good. Yeah, feature phone down ports were they, they, by this era? Yeah. It was disappointing. Oh yeah. Cuz because I do want to say, you know, as much as we're kind of like talking about how shitty so many of these are yeah. except for Street Fighter <laughs> uh and Neo Geo Pocket Color. Right. Um a lot, of, a lot of these, the only reason we want to talk about them is because we played a shitload of them. Oh, yeah. And, and when it, you were a kid, all the time, someone would be like, oh, what what game system do you have? And you're like, oh, I've got the Super Nintendo. And they're like, oh, well, how are you going to play Doom? And you're like, well, they got Doom on the Super Nintendo. Right. And you'd go buy it and you'd play it for 700 hours. <laughs> and then you'd go, it's the worst, but <laughs> technically I'm playing Doom. And at the end of this episode, we are going to talk about a lot of good down ports. A lot of good yeah, conversions. We'll get there. Uh, so we're, um, we're going to sound really negative for a while because we're about to shit on a lot of things, but yeah. eventually we're going to get to some good stuff. Um, there's also a D makes long after the fact, which uh, Elgin and Daphs wrote in and mentioned Final Fantasy VII on right. NES. Um, actually, both of our write-ins mentioned Final Fantasy VII <laughs> NES port, which I believe is just the Final Fantasy III engine yes. um, with Final Fantasy VII laid on top of it. Well, and it, was, a, it was modified pretty heavily, too. Yeah, I mean it's it's definitely I say laid on top of it. <laughs> it's it's very different. Oh yeah. Um, but if you played Final Fantasy three and you look at that, you go, oh, it's Final Fantasy three. I mean, they um, added in some features from FF seven like materia and stuff. So it, yeah, there is definitely some differences. It's it's really functional. Oh yeah. Um, another big one I played a lot of was Halo twenty six hundred, <laughs> which is the Atari twenty six hundred port of Halo, I which I would say. Great. That one's a full-on demake. Yeah. Uh, although I'd say Final Fantasy VII NES is also really uh, kind of in that oh, in-between yeah. phase of they kept enough of it that you could call it a downpour, but really it's probably a demake. Right. Um, and I can't really think of any other big long after the fact demakes. People come out with them. You see demake mock-ups a lot. Right. But you don't. You, it, it, there's less in the way of like ROM hacks and stuff. Yeah. These days I've it seems we're more likely of. to get original games on classic consoles right. than than new demakes. Uh, and then finally, our last two categories are just specific games we want to talk about. And we're going to begin with examples of poorly executed demakes and downports. And this is basically where just Saturn complains about the Atari. Oh, man, I get to rag on all kinds of shit <laughs> for uh, 20 minutes. We're going to get past the Atari pretty quick, actually, because I, I just want to briefly mention it for Pac-Man. Okay. Because what an awful port <laughs> Pac-Man is on Atari 2600. <laughs> Like, I, I know the story behind it. I know the poor guy was rushed and he was given like two weeks to make the game or some shit. And I feel bad for him. And I know right. it's not his fault that he made such a horrible product. And I know it also is given credit for destroying the entire video game industry, which <laughs> may be true. I don't know. But yeah, it is worth noting how bad that port is. And if you haven't played it, I recommend that you go and and look at it. Go look at a yep. video. Um, go go play it and then think, do video games really deserve to exist? <laughs> and because I, and they it, asked themselves that question and said no. <laughs> so to put it in perspective, the Atari came out in seven in nineteen seventy seven, uh, mm-hmm. the Atari twenty six hundred, and that game came out in eighty two, and it was already pretty bad. And didn't stack up to its arcade counterpart. Now, they later made some better arcade conversions on Atari after that. And the Atari continued to get ports until at least 1990. (laughs) Could you imagine being the kid the year that Super Mario Brothers 3 came Mm -hmm. out getting a copy of an Atari port? Oh, yeah. Oh, man. Think about it this way. The year after Easebook 1 and 2 came out in North America... You could get clacks for Atari 2600. Oh, fucking clacks! Yeah. And I think Atari a Warriors came out that year, too. Yeah. Um, it's There's some really bad ones on Atari. Uh, another one that I'll mention real quick is Donkey Kong. Uh, because while it is playable on the Atari, it's, it's missing a lot. I think it was missing yeah. two whole stages on the Atari. 
Um, Coleco did the port to all the early consoles. And the Coleco Vision version was the best of them and the closest to the arcade, probably mm-hmm. because Coleco wanted their system to look better. Right. Um, so it's pretty close to the arcade, still not quite perfect. Fortunately, we had the NES come around, and the NES is made by Nintendo, who also made Donkey Kong. So It just doesn't include the whole fucking game. Yeah, so they just left out a fucking level. <laughs> Otherwise, it would have been a perfect goddamn port. Has there ever been a f- real full port of the arcade Donkey Kong? Yeah, uh, for 3DS, uh, they and I think Wii U as well. They finally released a a special edition of Donkey Kong NES that included that extra level to make the oh, game. Oh, yeah, I remember complete. that happening. What's that? It, it was the the cement factory, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah their pie factory, as yeah. some people call it. Yeah, that, I remember that happening. It was it was it was a semi big deal, and then everyone went, "Oh yeah, it's just still Donkey Kong." <laughs> yeah, I have that version on my retro pie. <laughs> Uh, let's talk Double Dragon, Saturn. Let's not. Um, it, it's uh, uh, NES port specifically. Yeah, uh, which would be Single Dragon, right? Now, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, first of all, it's single player. Yeah. It's not a great conversion. No. But I didn't know this. The Sega Master System got a better version of Double Dragon oh, yeah. than the NES. Have you played the Master System version? No, why would I play Master System? Oh, it's pretty game? solid. It's it's a actually someone's pretty... gonna write in. There are good reasons to play Master System <laughs> there games. There are several games that I really enjoy on Master System. Uh, in fact, that would be one of them because it is a much better version than the NES version. Uh, yeah. I would recommend if you want to play an eight bit port of Double Dragon, play the Master System version. Uh, you also have the Tengen Sega ports to the NES. Yeah, yeah. So Tengen, uh, which as we know was actually just Atari games. Uh, got the rights to several Sega games to put on NES, and some of them turned out okay, like Fantasy Zone. Yeah. Uh, others, like Afterburner and Shinobi, uh, didn't. They look like... Uh, how would you even do Afterburner on the NES? Try it. <laughs> I guess the answer is you don't. <laughs> the thing is, uh, like like uh, uh, 3D World Runner on NES tried to basically be... Well, it tried to be Space Harrier, really. Right, but uh, that used a similar graphic trick than Afterburner did in the arcade, so you would think that theoretically it should be possible. But Tingen was not told of that because they <laughs> fucked it up hard. Tell me about the early Capcom PC ports because you have a lot of experience with these. I do, and I've played none them. of them, and I don't want to play any of them. <laughs> and so Capcom licensed out several games to High Tech Entertainment to port to PC. Uh, including DOS ports of Mega Man 1 and 3, which, uh, for the record, have nothing at all to do with Mega Man 1 or 3. (laughs) There was never a Mega Man 2 for DOS. There was just Mega Man 1 and 3. Uh, I don't think any of the Robot Masters were the same as the NES ones. Uh, The stages Mm -hmm. were different. The graphics were different. The physics were so different. Uh, it supported one button controllers. Great. How do you jump? Up. Oh no. Yeah. In a Mega Man. Oh game. no. Up is no. Yeah. Uh fortunately, uh uh Capcom eventually took control of porting their PC games, but not until High Tech Entertainment also ported Street Fighter One and Two to DOS. <laughs> and uh Street Fighter Two looks like the arcade game high tech did a great job with the graphics they they supported full vga graphics it looked pretty close to the arcade game like a couple things were stretched right. a little off but at least as close as the super nes version um and it supported uh one button controllers great let me guess up is jump well yeah it's always up is always jumping street fighter well fine <laughs> um no, I think it actually supported two button controllers, uh, but it was not a good port. Uh, Street Fighter One also, Street Fighter One on DOS is is historically unplayable in that uh, it only supports keyboard; it does not support joysticks at all, um, and uh, and it's not responsive at all. Like it doesn't even pay yeah. attention to your inputs. It's terrible. Uh, then Capcom took over and did ports of Mega Man X and Super Street Fighter Two, which were pretty good ports, not great, but definitely playable. Uh, and then they licensed out Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo to Game Tech, a company that is best known for their ports of Wheel of Fortune and Jeopardy. <laughs> uh, the perfect candidate. Yes. It was, uh, it's bad. I don't recommend that one. Let's talk Dragon's Lair, uh, because 
it was never really ported to home consoles until like recently. Oh, they tried. It was it was demade. Yeah. Well, they had weird. It, they had it on. There was a Game Boy Color version, mm-hmm. and allegedly, it wasn't the worst version of the game. Yeah, and it actually tries to emulate the arcade game. Uh, yeah, and it does an okay job. But then the you, NES version is just a fucking train wreck. Yeah, you look at the things on NES, Super NES, uh, original Game Boy. I want to say Genesis as well. That have nothing at all to do with the arcade game. Like, well, the same characters are there, and that's it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you have Final Fight on Super Nintendo, mm-hmm. which is another time that co-op was removed. Yeah. As well as a third of the playable characters. Yep. Uh, later on, they'd come out with Final Fight Guy, and they would put Guy back in the game, but remove Cody. Yeah. Because that's what we want. We, we want multiple versions of the game that we have to buy. Right. And I guess, technically, you could feel like you had the whole game if you set up two TVs next to each other and two Super <laughs> Nintendos, right. one with Final Fight and one with Final Fight Guy, and Perfect. played them at the same time. Right. Also, Final Fight Guy was rental exclusive. You couldn't even buy it. Yeah, it's expensive as shit. Yeah, it is. Uh, you have Pit Fighter now, on Super I Nintendo. I want to take a quick moment, because oh, yeah. uh, Final Fight, aside from those two issues is generally referred to as an excellent port. And it is. It, yeah. I mean, certainly, yeah. The it, it plays okay. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's fine. I would still recommend the Sega CD version first. I guess we do have it in the poorly executed category. Right. So I did want to... But I would say it's, it should go in the middle, it's fine category. Yeah. <laughs> Unless you wanted characters that were in the arcade version or to play with another player. As long as you only want to play Hagar, it's fine. You have Pit Fighter, Ugh. which I don't even know why they would port Pit Fighter to anything. Yeah, anything. first of all, the arcade game is awful, but uh, the Genesis port was at least a, a functioning port of the arcade game, and it was handled by right. Tengen, who did the arcade version. Uh, however, they licensed it to THQ for the Super NES version, and I don't know what they were doing. Maybe they had never touched a Super Nintendo possibly that's possible that's my only guess <laughs> virtual fighter 2 on genesis a famously bad port yeah. and it's playable very but it's not good uh, have you played it recently yeah, no i have Why? let me tell you <laughs> what the fuck yeah. yeah and what is even happening right my favorite part was for months maybe a year before its release sega was going on and on about how in order to possibly handle a home conversion of Virtua Fighter, you had to have the 32X. It was impossible to ever put it on Genesis. But then Virtua Fighter 2, like, here you go. Here it is. I I remember when I found it on whatever it was on, maybe my Genesis Classic or something, I, I booted it up and I was like, oh, Vir- Virtua Fighter 2, cool. <laughs> and I got in and I was like, this isn't Virtua Fighter 2. No. it's What a, the fuck? What is happening? What is one, this? One, it's a 2D game. And then I had got into the game and I jumped and I never came back down. So I just turned it <laughs> off. <laughs> I yeah, don't... That's about right. Uh, you have Mega Man and Base on GBA. Yeah, which is a shame because the Super NES game is excellent. And the GBA game has some weird timing issues and the resolution is wrong. And sometimes enemies well, can shoot at you from off screen. And The resolution is fine mm. because they kept it at its original size and just gave you a little window that you look right. into where you can't see anything. Exactly. Uh, I don't. Uh, I have many it's like, problems. It's like playing it through a mail slot. Right. Uh, let's get into examples of well-executed demakes and downports. Mm-hmm. Uh, first up, you have Miss Pac-Man and Junior Pac-Man on the Atari Twenty Six Hundred. Right, which which were handled very well compared to regular Pac-Man. Uh, <laughs> both of them look. They're not that different of games. No. How did they fuck up Pac-Man so bad? Know. But they look good. They sound good. They play good. If you want to play a Pac-Man game on the Atari, these are the ones you should play. There you go. Uh, oh, we did. Um... Oh, yeah, we'll get to that one. Okay. Uh, Defender on Atari, yes. also a good port. Oh, yeah, excellent port. Uh, it it had very smooth scrolling for an Atari game, which was incredibly uncommon. So uh, uh, huge props to whoever ported that one. Yeah. Uh, and then you have uh, Bionic Commando, which I never even realized was a port. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was an arcade game. I thought I thought NES Bionic Commando was the original. Yeah, no, there was, a, there was an arcade game. Um, it, it's technically a different game. Like it still had the, mm-hmm. the grapple arm, uh, and cannon as your only two buttons. Uh, right. but it didn't have the stage select like the NES game does. Uh, it didn't allow you to, uh, uh level up by picking up the little pellets or anything. So, uh, it was a different game. Just the NES game was inspired by it. And I would say significantly better. 
Right. Really, really, um, I, I guess you'd call it a D make. Maybe. More so than a downpour. Uh, a possi- side make. Possibly even a sequel. <laughs> yeah, I could see that. Yeah. Uh, you have Contra on NES. Yeah, which was at least more what? fair than the arcade game. We, it, and that's saying something yeah. because it's not an incredibly <laughs> fair no. game. Uh, you have Golden Axe on Genesis, which was a a, a great port. Oh, yeah. Um, having played both, I kind of prefer the Genesis version, yeah. honestly. Yeah, and, the, and the thing is, there was a, a period there where a lot of arcade conversions <laughs> were had improvements on their home ports. Like it didn't look quite as yeah. good. Uh, and maybe it didn't even control quite as good, but it would have multiple difficulty levels. It might have an extra stage or it might have uh, a crossover with another game or some other thing that you could get in there that wasn't in the arcade. So, And, right. and Golden Axe was one of those ones that just uh, felt like it had more to the experience than the arcade game did. Uh, you have Ninja Gaiden, which was ported from arcades yep. uh, to... It was on the Turbo Graphics. There was the NES version. Yep. There was the Super Nintendo Collection. Right. Um, although I think there was only the, ever the one arcade Ninja Gaiden, right, right. um, two and three were, were, you know, NES. directly to right. the NES and then ported to the SNES. So a weird series of ports, right. but it's a completely different game than its oh, arcade yeah. counterpart and a far superior, the, 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 the arcade game is just kind of like a super simplistic, like Kung Fu level simplicity brawler. Right. And Ninja Gaiden on NES is a great, awesome game. Yeah. So with a lot of platforming. Uh, and even the Turbo Graphics port is Fun. okay if you don't need eyes. <laughs> as long as you can ignore whatever is happening in that parallax layer, it's a fine I don't know port. what the fuck. I don't know who saw that and was like, yeah, ship it. <laughs> we'll make everyone go blind. It's like staring at a magic eye puzzle while playing Ninja Gaiden all, all the whole time. Right. Uh, the Turbo Graphics got a lot of shmups that we've covered. Yes. Uh, R-Type, Salamander, Galaga 88 and 90. The list goes on. Yeah. And all of them that I've touched have been great ports. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, all the Konami ones, especially, like uh, Salamander, Gradius, Proteus, all those, Twin B as well, are just phenomenal yep. ports. Uh, you have Turtles in Time, which is a, yet another example, like you were saying, of, of a game that improved upon its original version. Right. Uh, in that it added multiple levels. Oh, yeah. um, I believe the entire, uh, uh, like, whatever, 1 million BC section was added. Um and I think that slash boss fight with slash was added. I believe that was the added mm-hmm. level. Um, I want to say the pirate ship level was also added, I, but it, I knew it, they it, added it, something. But I, I was going to trust your judgment on that one. Yeah, at this point, I'm going off of memory. Right. I should look that one. <laughs> but they added content, and it was a great port. Yeah. Um, certainly, they made some some concessions as far as uh, graphics and sure. animation. All right. um, but they got but to use the mode seven. The mode seven. <laughs> That's what matters. <laughs> Uh, you have Street Fighter 2 Champion Edition on PC Engine. Yeah. Uh, um, most people played the Super Nintendo version, which is a good port. Oh yeah. And the Genesis version was also a good port um, of, of Street Fighter 2. But this one was possibly the most accurate until what? Until the Saturn version? Probably. probably? Um, now, now, there are some arguments about that, too. Uh, some people will say that, that one of the others is slightly better at one thing or the other. But, right. but for me... Uh, the fact that they ported the game so impressively to an 8-bit console as the oh, PC yeah. Engine is just incredibly impressive. Because it, it looks and feels just like the arcade game. Do they have an option to play it with two buttons? Or is yeah. it just like, no, buy a six-button oh, controller? Oh, you can play it with a two-button controller. Uh, mm. If I remember right, uh, on the two-button controller, start is light punch, two is medium punch, one is heavy punch. Then you start hit, is light punch. Or sorry, run, run. Is no, light I punch. mean still, I'm not. Uh, yes. Upset about your nomenclature. Yeah. I'm upset that they put an attack on one of the middle buttons. Yes. And then you hit select, and it would change them all to kicks. No, oh, no. J- that sounds bad. It's the same as the three button Genesis version, where A, B, and uh, C are punch. You hit start, and then A, B, and C are kicks. Yeah, but lots of people had six button Genesis controllers, so they didn't. The six-button controller didn't come out till the day Street Fighter Two came out on the Genesis, right? But it was—I don't—I feel like it was more prevalent than the Avenue Pad on the PC Engine. Well, we never got Street Fighter or an Avenue Pad over here in America, so I True. can't say definitively. Not having had either, but no. uh, I can say that I knew plenty of people with Street Fighter on Genesis who still just had three-button controllers. <laughs> oh, so sad. Yeah. 
Uh, speaking of fighting games, we have X-Men vs. Street Fighter and Marvel Super Heroes vs. Street Fighter both ported to Saturn. Re and really, we could put every Capcom fighting game conversion to the Saturn yes. in here. Right. Uh, and even the Dreamcast uh, right. Capcom fighting game which, conversions were, were all very well oh done. Oh, yeah. Which some of the Dreamcast ones feel like they're cheating, like Marvel Cap 2, since it was built on Dreamcast hardware. Right. But, uh, but Street Fighter 3 wasn't, and that was an excellent port. Mm-hmm. Um, though they're all very well done and the differences are, I would say, negligible to all but probably the most dire fans oh, yeah. of the franchises, respectively. Right. Uh, Saturn, tell me about DDR and PS1. Uh, so it was an excellent port, first of all. Uh, not only did the game play and look right on the PlayStation, which at that time was five years old, uh, but Konami went the extra mile and released dance mats for it so that you could play it the same way you did in the arcade. And it looked right, it felt right, and they ended up releasing six or seven different volumes on the PS1, just so that you could have all the different soundtracks you might want. And I also want to give honorable mention to the Game Boy Color port of Dance Dance Revolution. <laughs> because not only did it have adorable MIDI covers of all my favorite songs from the arcade version, but it came with this tiny thumb-sized dance pad for your Game Boy Color that just clipped on the bottom. And I've never seen one because that game was only ever released in Japan for Game Boy Color. But uh, yeah. the pictures are adorable, and I would love to find one one day. I had, uh, I mean, we don't have any of them mentioned here, but as far as rhythm games, I had Guitar Hero for DS Lite. Oh, wow. How was that? That had, it had a, so you put the game in the DS slot. Right. And then in the GBA slot, you slid in a peripheral that gave you four fret buttons. Mm. And you would strum using the stylus oh, on, the on your screen? on the touch Ooh. screen. It, and then the peripheral had this thing that would hook onto your hand. So you would do the frets with your fingers that were down behind the system. Ugh. And you would strum with the touch screen. And you know what? Yeah. It was bad. <laughs> <laughs> was it exactly I, as bad as I expected it to be? I got the whole thing for $5 brand new at GameStop. <laughs> they were ecstatic that I was taking it. <laughs> Um, and it, it was more functional. Like I literally bought it cause I was like, this is so stupid. Right. Um, and it was more functional than I thought it would be. Nice. I wouldn't recommend it, <laughs> but if you find one for $5 in a GameStop, it's fun to laugh at. Nice. Uh, you have basically all Sega light gun games for Saturn and Dreamcast. Saturn and Dreamcast are just, just fantastic arcade, arcade systems oh, to yeah. begin with. Arcade ports on them across the board right. were stellar uh all the fighting games all the light gun games oh, yeah. are are done great right uh you have super mario brothers deluxe yeah which is kind of a d make but it falls in that same era or that same category as the the super mario advance games right. where it's it adds a lot of features right. but it also makes some concessions risky conversion yeah. decisions <laughs> <laughs> uh in that your screen you're looking at a much smaller screen right. Um, so it's, it's a little more difficult to play than the original. Now they did in that uh, regard, try to make up for that by allowing you to scroll left a little bit more than you would have been able to on the NES. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you can go back a bit, uh, compared to the NES game. But other than that, it's mostly just very difficult. Um, yeah, the, uh, the lost levels portion of it where you can unlock the Japanese Mario two, uh, also loses some because it loses some of the physics of the original. Mm -hmm. But the fact that they included that entire game also in there is nuts. Right. That's, that's pretty laudable. Um, I also have listed the Mega Man Game Boy games as well as the Mega Man Extreme Game Boy Color games. Right. Um, the, the Game Boy games were okay. Yeah, they were basically spinoffs as much as they were uh, down Right. Uh, but they played very, very similarly to the NES games, enough that if you were very good at the NES games, you were probably also very good at those. Uh, and the Mega Man Extreme games are very much just sort of demakes of Mega Man X. Right, one and two. Uh, in that they are, again, themed around Mega Man X, yeah. but play very differently. And there's a, there are a handful of levels that feel the same. Yeah, they are tremendously difficult games, yeah. but they're... Okay, as far as Game Boy Color conversions right. go. Uh, you have R-Type DX on Game Boy Color, which is a great version of oh, R-Type. Yeah. Really impressive. Surprisingly fun on a Game Boy Color. Right. 
uh, Dragon Warrior 1 and 2 and Dragon Warrior 3 on Game Boy Color. Um, I think you've stated before that these 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 are potentially some of your favorite ports. Yeah, as far as uh, localized ports, uh, I would say that they may be the definitive versions. Uh, their, their localization is dated now, uh, yeah. so I might lean people towards the Switch or mobile versions now just because of the newer localization. But as far as mm-hmm. actual gameplay is concerned, I think I would take these over the, the current port. Yeah. Uh, you have Super Nintendo on GBA, which we mentioned previously, Final Fantasies 4, 5, and 6, the Super Mario Advance series, except for Yoshi's Island, which gets a little bit of hate. Yeah. Um, the Donkey Kong Country games on GBA yeah. were, as far as I could tell, faithful versions of Donkey Kong Country. And I want to say they were ported by Rare to the, the Game Boy Advance. Were they? I, I didn't believe realize so. that. Hmm. Um, but they were... They were good. Yeah. Um, also, um, uh, uh, the first F Zero on GBA was, it technically was a sequel, no. but it really was just it's F Zero, it's more F Zero, <laughs> and it was really good yeah. and really impressive yeah. for for a GBA game. Right. I also, when we first picked this topic, I had this grand idea that I was going to play through like as many Game Boy <laughs> Advance D makes and downports as I could. So you got, and that fell you apart. got through uh, 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 aggressive in line. That fell apart quickly. I played Perfect Dark on Game Boy Color, mm. which is a fascinating game. Yeah. It's not good, right. but it's a fascinating conversion <laughs> of Perfect Dark right. to the Game Boy Color. Yeah. It basically makes it this weird top-down shooter with occasional first-person shooting gallery right. segments. Um, also, uh, um, it's not... A, a really a D maker downport because it's its own game. Right. Um, but Metal Gear Solid uh, uh, Ghost Babble, uh, Ghost Babble yeah. on Game Boy Color is is a very interesting conversion oh, yeah. of Metal Gear Solid, kind of back to the Metal Gear's series' right. roots. Feels like the in a NES weird game, way. Kinda. And then I also just kind of played some random GBA games. Mm-hmm. Um, Alien Hominid got a really good GBA port. Oh yeah, and granted, this was, uh, it's coming from a Flash. Right, but still, the fact that they were able to get, um, as far as I can tell, most of the animation in there, and it played smoothly, yeah. like, it, it, it's not like the GBA handled Flash. Right, no. You know, obviously it was ported, and it's a pretty good port of Alien Hominid, if you like Alien Hominid. Right. Um, and the, <laughs> this one I just left on there, because <laughs> when I was making my list, uh-huh. I played Lego Star Wars on GBA. Yeah. Just because I was flipping, and I was like, oh, see what that's like. <laughs> And I played it, and I was like, hey, Lego Star Wars and GBA is pretty good. And you went, that's interesting. I found it on this list of worst GBA games of all time, <laughs> near the top. Yeah. It was in the top 10 of that guy's list. <laughs> and I really kind of left it on here as a laugh, because <laughs> it's, I'll say this. Uh-huh. It is the best version of Lego Star Wars that you would imagine being on GBA. <laughs> the the guy's uh, problem with it was it apparently skipped a lot of the story of Lego Star Wars and left out a bunch oh of characters. Oh my god. And, and I'm cut sorry, a bunch buddy. of stages and, and stuff like that. It's a GBA port <laughs> of a 3D platformer game. Right. That's nuts! <laughs> I don't even think we talked about all the Rayman stuff. I'm pretty sure Rayman's been ported like 800 times at right. this point. Oh yeah. Um we could probably go on for forever. Yeah, for for weeks. But that's some D makes and down. We could go on and, just on a single console for for hours. And I hope it has in, inspired you in some ways because I do think in this era of infinite choice where we all own every library in full no intro ROM sets right. downloaded casually off of archive.org <laughs> where we know to go, okay, I want to play Street Fighter 2. What is the absolute best, most, most faithful, uh, content-rich version of it? And you can just play that, and you never have to look at these weird, right. risky conversions <laughs> that were made. We really you can like just that ignore phrase, them. don't we? I like that a lot. <laughs> Um, and you can just ignore things like Mega Man Extreme, because right. why would I play that? I have Mega Man X right. on my, you know, on whatever Nintendo. handheld I'm playing. Yeah. Or, yeah, you know, I've uh, is that on nintendo switch online well i guess it's in the x collection right so it's yeah. probably not on online you're like yeah i've got it on my switch why do i need that version so you might ignore it right. and I, I do think there's some merit to checking a lot of these out yeah. one because very often like in the case of like metal gear on game boy color right. they're really interesting yeah 
And um, and a lot of the uh, things that we didn't mention are, are like the games that just got taken for granted that they would be on every possible platform. Things based on movies, things based on big uh, franchises or licenses, uh, as well as uh, what we're used to now as annual games. Uh, things right. things like uh, Tony Hawk on Game Boy Color or oh yeah, which I didn't even mention any of those. Right, I I, I really honestly I could just talk about specifically Game Boy D makes for forever right. because I played a shitload of Tony Hawk's Pro Skater Two on Game Boy Color yeah. and it was trash. But <laughs> you know what? It was kind of weird and fun. Yeah. I want to say uh, the second Harry Potter movie game got a Game Boy Color version. <laughs> oh no, and that was like two thousand three. Um, it's uh th- there's a lot of weird interesting fun things oh, yeah. that have been ported out there that i think get mostly ignored because they're regarded as in air quotes not the best version of that game right. and sometimes objectively so but it doesn't mean that they're not still really interesting oh yeah from a, often for just from a gameplay perspective yeah. you know in your head you're like how the fuck do you get street fighter on a game boy right. how do a black and white game boy how does that <laughs> even happen and how is it not the worst yeah. And, and like I mentioned and earlier, not. sometimes I just like to compare all the different versions uh, right in front of me. And sometimes you'll like find some weird, obscure arcade game. And then you'll look at each of the different console conversions. And you're like, oh, this one added a power up system or this one added a stage select or just different things that you might see between them that you might wish somebody had made a definitive version of that game. And it never yeah. fucking happens <laughs> ever. Anyway, that's d Makes and Downports. Yes. Thank you for listening. If you would like to help the show out, you can do so at patreon.com slash retro warriors, which you can give us money, <laughs> which is great and very useful to us. <laughs> you can also rate and review us on your podcast aggregator of choice, be it iTunes or Google Play or Spotify, if they have that. I don't think they do. Wherever. Or really just tell a friend about the show, because that's the best way to uh, help right. out your favorite podcast Indeed. is to get people to listen to them. Right. Anyway, thank you so much for listening. We will be back next week. And as always, let us us cling cling together. together.